But we have seen um, the government of Israel take additional steps. They voted last week to allow 250 trucks per day in, and then the, you know, in addition, the prime minister instructed the Minister of Defense to make every effort to get that level of daily truck deliveries up to 350, which is the number that we called for uh, in the letter. As you know, they now have five crossings open. They reopened a crossing that had been closed. They opened a new crossing, things that we called for. They restarted the Jordan Air Force's corridor, something that we had called for. Uh, they removed 30 items from the dual use restricted list, something that we had called for in the letter uh, on behalf of a number of humanitarian organizations that had been calling for those steps to be taken. Um, they restored deliveries to the north. Uh, they expanded the Mawasi humanitarian zone by 25%, something that we had called for uh, in the letter. Um, they are implementing the UN's plan to prepare for winter, which includes things like repairing roads. Um, but when you look at escalation of this conflict, it has been Russia that has escalated the conflict time and time again, bringing in an Asian military to a conflict inside Europe. The Russians say that um, you know they can just deploy whoever they like to to curse because it's inside their own country. Uh, what's the what's the kind of uh, principle here that a country can't? Um, bring in other troops to defend. So the first principle that we need to remember, of course, and I know you haven't forgotten this, but um, uh, for everyone else, is that it is Russia that started this war. Raise this a little. Afternoon. Afternoon. Happy Monday, everyone. Let's get started. The United States is today imposing sanctions on Amana, the largest organization involved in settlement and illegal outpost development in the West Bank, as well as its subsidiary, Benyane Bar Amana. Amana is a key part of the Israeli extremist settler movement. It maintains ties to a number of individuals previously sanctioned by the U.S. government, and it has helped establish dozens of illegal settler outposts and directly engage in the dispossession of private land owned by Palestinians. In addition, we are imposing sanctions on Al Hari Yehuda Company, its owner Itamar Yehuda Le Levy, Shabtai Koshlevsky, the vice president of Hasamor Yosh, and violent extremist Zohar Sabak. The actions of these individuals and this company have contributed both directly and indirectly to the rise of violence in the West Bank. The United States remains committed to, in, to fighting increasing extremist, extremist settler violence. Over the past 10 months, we have sanctioned 33 entities and individuals, including today's actions, for their activities in the West Bank. These sanctions have targeted an ever-broadening array of actors, from individuals to organizations, for their roles in the escalating violence and instability. There is no justification for extremist violence against civilians, period. We are committed to working with Israel and the Palestinian Authority to de-escalate violence in the West Bank, which has cost the lives of too many Israeli and Palestinian civilians. The President and the Secretary have repeatedly stressed with their Israeli counterparts that Israel must do more to stop violence against civilians in the West Bank and hold accountable those responsible for it. But as we have also made clear, in the absence of such ac actions by the Government of Israel, we will continue to take our own steps to hold those responsible for violent <coughs> extremism accountable. And with that, Matt. Um, Congratulations okay. on the Bills victory yesterday. Thank you. Big one. It was a, it was, yes, it was big. Yeah. And it was good. <laughs> yeah. I won't speak, I, I, I won't. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I, the whole country, with the exception of maybe Kansas I'm not, City area, is happy. I'm not a, I'm not a partisan to either of those teams, so I won't speak to the relevant, uh, the relative goodness, mm -hmm. but, you know, let right. the remarks stand. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, before we get back to the, uh, uh, to uh, what I'm sure will be a lot of questions about the Middle East. I just wanted to ask you quickly about transition. Is there anything new to report on contacts between incoming team and state? So a couple things. With respect to the official transition process, no, there's nothing that has changed. Um, I'll let other agencies speak to the memorandum of understanding process. My understanding is that there has not been uh, a signed memorandum of understanding, which is what has to take place before the 
uh, incoming administration's transition team can come start work here, getting briefed and getting access to information um, to, to uh, proceed in the transition process. That, that process has not changed. There has been an additional contact I can read out. Uh, the secretary uh, phoned uh, secretary-designate Marco Rubio yesterday to offer his congratulations uh, on his appointment and to pledge to him, as we have said publicly, that we will do everything within our power to make it a successful transition. Okay, and there was, but the, the, that was the extent of it. it that was, was the extent of a call. They called, yeah. Um, okay, now um, on to the. Uh, well, does anyone have another transition question? Did the secretary uh, talk about any policy issue? I'm not going to get into uh, any further specifics of, uh, other than that. He, what I said, which is he called to offer his congratulations and pledged that we would work to make it a successful transition. So, um, uh, on the Lebanon um, front, there's a whole flurry of speculation and. Uh, and reports that something is in something is in the works. Can you fill us in on where things stand there? So we continue to be engaged um, with our Israeli counterparts, with the government of Lebanon, with another number of other countries, both in the region and outside the region, to try and reach a resolution to the conflict across the blue line. Uh, as you know, we've been trying for some time to get uh, uh, a resolution that would see UN Security Council Resolution 1701 fully enforced, and we are making progress on it, but um, I wouldn't want to comment on it beyond that. Um, do you know if there is, 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 are people heading out to the region? Uh, well, we always have people moving around various places in the region, but with respect to any travel to Lebanon, uh, I don't have any to announce today. Okay. Not everybody at once? Yes, is it, wait for all right, Alex. Front row is very demure today. It's like everybody, well, actually, it's like everybody else was watching the, the Bills game and celebrating. <laughs> no. Can we just stay down on the Middle East if he wants to? Uh, sure, uh, sure. I just um, on Gaza uh, and, yeah. uh, and the aid situation, which does not seem to have improved significantly at all since last week in your announcement last week. Uh, What's the latest on that? So we have seen the situation improve, though to see the actual um, realization of all of those improvements, we do think will take some time. But we have seen um, the government of Israel take additional steps. They voted last week to allow 250 trucks per day in. And then the, you know, in addition, the prime minister instructed the Minister of Defense to make every effort to get that level of daily truck deliveries up to 350, which is the number that we called for uh, in the letter. As you know, they now have five crossings open. They reopened a crossing that had been closed. They opened a new crossing, things that we called for. They restarted the Jordan Air Forces corridor, something that we had called for. Uh, they removed 30 items from the dual use restricted list, something that we had called for in the letter uh, on behalf of a number of humanitarian organizations that had been calling for those steps to be taken. Um, they restored deliveries to the north. Uh, they expanded the Mawasi humanitarian zone by 25%, something that we had called for uh, in the letter. Um, they are implementing the UN's plan to prepare for winter, which includes things like repairing roads, facilitating the entry of winter-specific aid, vaccinations for winter-specific diseases. Um, and so we have seen them take a number of steps, some of which have been public, some of which they have communicated to us, and I'm making public now. And it will, it will take some time to see whether those actually translate to what they're supposed to translate to, which is more humanitarian assistance making it into Gaza, and then more humanitarian assistance making it to the actual people inside Gaza that need to get it. And that's what we're committed to seeing uh, take place over the coming weeks. Yeah. Um, just, I guess this is related to sort of transition. Um, do you have any comment on uh, uh, reporting about um, Elon Musk meeting with the Iranian ambassador last week I, on I, Monday. I don't. Okay. I don't. <laughs> yeah. Going back to Lebanon, Matt, can you say whether there have been any gaps that have narrowed in the negotiations over a diplomatic resolution here? Have Hezbollah presented any response to the proposals that are said to have been briefed to them? You know, I just don't think it's productive, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, to get into the details of the back and forth negotiations, only to say that. We have been at this for some time now. Um, we have been sharing proposals, um, both with the government of Lebanon and the government of Israel. Both sides have reacted to, their, to the proposals that we have put forward. There has been uh, an exchange of different ideas uh, for how to see 
what we believe is in everyone's interest, which is the full implementation of uh, UN Security Council 170, Resolution 1701. And we're going to continue to stay at that process because we believe a diplomatic resolution is key to allowing uh, the fighting to stop, to protecting civilians, and allowing the civilians in both Israel and Lebanon to return to their homes. In past weeks, there has been optimism around the discussions uh, to varying degrees. Are you able to give us a characterization of where that stands now? Are you optimistic that something can come together I am, in the coming I, I am not going to make a characterization, which shouldn't read anything uh, uh, into, other than that to say we are committed to trying to get these negotiations over the finish line. We believe it is in the government of Israel to get them over the finish line. We believe it is in the, uh, the interests of the government of Lebanon to get them over the finish line. I'm not going to characterize the chances other than to say when you have a resolution in the interest of all the relevant parties, um, we ought to be able to get to an agreement. And that's what we're going to try to do. And then switching um, to Doha and the calls for Hamas to be uh, booted out of the country, where does things stand there? Are there still Hamas officials in Qatar? If not, where where are they now? And what's the uh, I will let the various relevant governments speak to where they are. Uh, I know the government of, of Qatar has spoken to this uh, to some extent. I've seen the reports that uh, some of the leadership of Hamas who had been in Doha have now um, moved to Turkey. I'm not in a position to dispute those reports. What I would say on behalf of the United States is that we don't believe the leaders of a vicious terrorist organization should be living comfortably anywhere. And that certainly includes in uh, a major... Remember that Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization that has murdered a number of Americans continues to hold to this day seven American citizens hostage. And of course, that's not to sp even to speak of the citizens of other countries that it has murdered and that it has held hostage. So to the extent that um, members of Hamas are uh, in Turkey or in any country, look, a number of these individuals uh, are under U.S. indictment, have been under U.S. indictment for some time, and we believe that they should be turned over to the United States. If they are in Turkey and aren't turned over um, or expelled or what have you, whatever asks may be made, what kind of consequences would there be for Turkey as a NATO ally? Uh, I, I don't want to get ahead of things here. We've just seen the reporting in the last few days that they have moved to Turkey. Um, but of course, we will make clear to the government of Turkey, as we have made clear to every country in the world, that there can be no more business as usual with Hamas. Uh, let me, uh, yeah, go ahead, Hiba. Up on the questions regarding Lebanon and the negotiations, uh, you you used to say, for example, when it comes to Hamas and Israel, the onus is on Hamas or on Israel. When it comes to Lebanon, where's the problem? Here or here? Lebanon, Hezbollah, or Israel? So both the government of Israel and the government of Lebanon need to agree to an ultimate resolution, a diplomatic resolution. Uh, obviously, that requires to both of them agreeing to the various proposals that we have put forward. And you can imagine, as is always the case in this kind of diplomatic engagement, there are things that each side wants and that things that each side objects to. And what we try to do is to work through that and get to uh, a resolution that, that both parties can agree to. But ultimately, the onus is on both of those countries. And when it comes to, what's, uh, to the internal politics in Lebanon, you've been trying to have a kind of political solution for the presidential elections and many things in Lebanon. Any update on these efforts? No, look, we continue to want to see the uh, Lebanese parliament um, elect a new president. We have been pushing for that since before um, the outbreak of violence in the past few months. We've been pushing for that since before October 7th, and we're continuing to push for it, but I don't have any update to offer. There are some, some talks that there are regional partners uh, pushing for a role to, the, uh, to Bashar al-Assad within Lebanon. Are you on the same page, or do you accept such a proposal to start with? Uh, I don't know what proposal that um, refers to specifically, and I wouldn't want to comment on it uh, here today. Thank you. So uh, let, me stay, let me just stay, try to stay in the region first. Yeah. Michelle, go ahead. Matt, do you support the uh, uh, Israeli right to intervene in Lebanon militarily in the, in the future in case the Lebanese armed forces or the UNIFIL uh, don't, uh, don't move against Hezbollah? 
so I, in, the, in, in the South. Yeah, so I don't want to speak to that specifically. Uh, I know there have been reports about various things that may or may not be under negotiation. And so I sometimes when I comment on uh, uh, even general questions like that here, they're interpreted as, as me weighing in on, on the specifics of negotiations. I will, of course, say that every country in the world has the right to defend itself uh, against terrorist attacks. That includes Israel, it includes other countries as well. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that. And will you give Israel guarantees in this regard? I'm just not going to speak to um, the underlying diplomatic negotiations. And is there only one draft that you are working on, or two drafts? Only one. Um, uh, that uh, I think I'm going to have to apply my previous answer, which is I'm not going to talk to the um, the specifics of the negotiations. Ultimately, we're looking to a proposal that can be agreed to by uh, both both countries. And do you know if Foxteen is going today uh, to Lebanon or? Uh, I would refer you to the White House for that. Uh, almost hasn't worked here for more than a year now, but I, I uh, direct you to the NSC to speak to his travel schedule. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Thank yeah. you, um, over the weekend, Haaretz uh, reported uh, on Israel's crackdown on foreign activists uh, in the occupied West Bank, stating that at least 16 foreign activists, many of them our Americans, have been expelled from Israel since uh, last October after being detained in the West Bank. Uh, are you have you seen these reports and do you have any reaction? Do you believe that uh, Israel is deliberately targeting um, foreign activists? Yeah, we have seen the reports and we are currently gathering more information about them. I don't have any specific uh, uh, information to speak to and so don't have any comment on them, but would say in general, um, we support the, the um, rule of law and due process and will continue to advocate for these principles, especially when they pertain to the treatment of U.S. citizens. And one more on this, uh, you know, activists being targeted or uh, Turkish American activist Ayşe Nur Ezgi uh, Ege, v v was also killed by Israel in the West Bank 69 uh, days ago, and there has been no accountability to this day. Uh, eyewitnesses say she was deliberately targeted by Israeli forces. The last time I raised this issue at the briefing, you told me that you were pressing Israel for answers. Have you received any answers? Do you have any update? No, I don't have an update. That continues to be the case. We have been uh, in contact with the government of Israel, including um, very recently about this case, to uh, make clear that we wanted to hear from them exactly what happened. Uh, as you know, the secretary has said that it is uh, unacceptable that anyone should be shot and killed just for attending a peaceful protest. And we continue to press the government of Israel to um, uh, conduct its investigation and to brief us on the results of that investigation. Uh, but I don't have an, an outcome to read out as of yet. Are there any steps that the State Department place, plans to take regarding this instead of, you know, uh, waiting for answers? So we want to see the end of the investigation before we um, uh, speak to that, which does not mean that it is an open-ended timeline, right? There's a, a point at which. Um, like, are we talking about weeks, I, months, I, or I'm, years? I'm not going to, to speak to it publicly. We're in conversation with the government of Israel about it. Um, but we want to see the in investigation be thorough. And then when we see the results, we'll, of course, be willing to speak to them at that time, as well as any additional steps uh, uh, that may or may not be warranted. Yeah. yeah thank you, Matt. On the U.S.-Iraqi discussion over the security relations in the future, you were scheduled to have a meeting in Baghdad before the end of this administration. But an Iraqi diplomat told me that the Iraqi government has requested the State Department to postpone the meeting to next year and changing the venue from Baghdad to Washington, D.C. Have you received such a request? And what updates do you have for me about your discussions with Iraq over security relations? Uh, I'm going to have to take that question and get back to you. I'm just not tracking the details of uh, either timing or location for that meeting. And uh, the, the, uh, another question related to this, I'm not sure if you have anything for me. Does changing administration in Washington have any impact on your discussion with Iraq over security relations and new forces in Iraq? So that gets back to a, a question um, I spoke to last time I was here, uh, which I guess was week before last, right after the election, when I, um, I was obviously traveling last week. And the general answer to that is I obviously can't speak to what the next administration will do on any policy area anywhere around the world. Um, 
we have made clear what we believe is in the interest of the United States, and we will continue to pursue those policies and continue to put them in, in place between now and January 20th, but I wouldn't want to speculate in any way what the next administration may do. And last question. The Iraqi militia groups has increased their attacks on Israel. I'm sorry, the, the, the Iraqi, Iraqi militias, militias yeah, yeah. yeah. They increased their attacks on Israel. Even yesterday, they attacked Iliad. And they are using a pretext that Israel has used the Iraqi airspace to attack Iran. And the Iraqi government were, was saying that we are going to engage with the U.S. on this. What's your comment on that? Do you think it's, it's the right pretext? Uh, we have, no, uh, we clearly do not. We have engaged with the government of Iraq uh, on this very question to make clear to them that uh, the government of Iraq should not allow the territory of Iraq to be used to launch terrorist attacks against anybody. And it is not in Iraq's interest to be pulled into uh, a, a re regional conflict. And so the government of Iraq should take all appropriate steps to prevent these terrorist organizations from launching such attacks. Thank you. Uh, staying in the region. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, move to Russia. I should have. Let me, let me just, I'll, I will come to you okay. next. Let me just make sure anyone else has uh, anything else in the region. Go ahead, and then I'll, I'll come back to you next time. Uh, thank you, Matt. According to Israel Behind the News report, UNRWA schools in Bethlehem are reopened, and UNRWA is actively participating in the war against Israel. My question to you is, will the U.S. therefore demand on arms and ammunition inspection of UNRWA schools and medical clinics and a follow-up? So I don't know what report you're referring to, but we do not believe that UNRWA is engaged in active war against the <clears throat> state of Israel. Okay. Uh, UNRWA, let me just finish. UNRWA exists to provide humanitarian services to the Palestinian people. We believe it's important work that they play. Now, we take very seriously the allegations that there were UNRWA employees um, who were involved in the terrorist acts of October 7th and made clear that that's absolutely unacceptable and those employees must be held accountable for those actions, but that's different than a uh, uh, painting with a broad brush the entire organization. Okay, another issue. In light of the U.S. UNRWA accord, which conditions USA to UNRWA on the removal of uh, incitement and texts and murals from UNRWA, will the U.S. demand that murals and texts which glorify murder of Jews be removed from UNRWA refugee camps in Bethlehem. Uh, I don't know exactly what specific report you're referring to, so I'm not going to comment on it. Simon, go ahead. Um, what can you tell, tell us about the what the current policy is on whether Ukraine can launch long-range missile strikes into into Russia using U.S. missiles? Uh, I don't have any policy updates to speak to today. Uh, as you know, since uh, even before Russia launched its full-scale invasion, the uh, United States has marshaled a coalition of more than 50 countries to provide assistance to Ukraine and to hold Russia accountable for its actions. We have made clear that we will always uh, adapt and adjust the capabilities that we provide to uh, Ukraine when it's uh, appropriate to do so, and you have seen us back that up with steps that we have taken over the past several years, uh, but I don't have any new policy developments to speak to today. Uh the, I mean, obviously, the, this is already being reported that, that there is a change of policy, and the, and the Kremlin has responded saying this is a this is a major escalation from the U.S. Do you have a, I mean, you're you not confirming the policy change, yeah. but but given that this is already information out there that that, that Russians are responding to, um, you know, what's your take on on? you know, them accusing you of escalating this conflict. Yeah, so again, I, I know this goes without saying, but let me say it anyway. Um, I'm not going to speak to or confirm in, any policy changes. Um, but when you look at escalation of this conflict, it has been Russia that has escalated the conflict time and time again. And that includes just in the recent month when Russia recruited the deployment of more than 11,000 North Korean soldiers who are now on the front lines in Kursk, engaging in combat operations against uh, the Ukrainian military. That is a major escalation by Russia, um, bringing in an Asian military to a conflict inside Europe. And as we said, uh, as the secretary said, our response to that would be firm. And the supporters of Ukraine's response to that needed to be firm. Um, and we will continue to do what is appropriate to hold Russia accountable for its actions, including its escalatory actions, and to hold North Korea accountable for its escalatory the, actions. The Russians say that um, you know they can just deploy whoever they like to, to curse because it's inside their own country. Uh, what's the what's the kind of uh, principle here that a country can't? Um, bring in other troops to defend. So the first principle that we need to remember, of course, and I know you haven't forgotten this, but um, uh, for everyone else, is that it is Russia that started this war by invading the sovereign territory of its neighbor. Um, Russia uh, that invaded Ukraine 
supported proxy war in 2014, uh, and then that launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And so if Russia wanted to stop the attacks on its territory, it's the aggressor here. And it could withdraw from Ukraine. It could stop targeting Ukrainian civilians. It could top, stop targeting Ukrainian, uh, targeting Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. It could stop occupying Ukrainian territory. So what it matters very much who is the aggressor in this conflict and who is the victim. But, but the fact that Ukraine is defending the occupation of its territory by launching attacks inside Russia in no way uh, justifies the escalation of this conflict by introducing uh, a foreign army into conflict directly with Ukrainian soldiers. And, and you've said uh, that you know after, since the election of of, of Donald Trump um, as the president elect, you've said you will surge you know, remaining remaining military assistance to Ukraine, um, and, and I, with with I guess the the idea of, of strengthening the Ukrainians. Uh, the, from the sort of comments from Russia, sort of saying, well, this is an outgoing administration and they are acting irresponsibly by, es by further escalating a conflict. And I know you're not confirming this particular act, but you have talked about, um, you know, rushing support for Ukraine and, and giving the Ukrainians as much as possible. Uh, yeah, is there a danger that you're, um, that you are, you know, fueling the fire of a conflict that you're successor may may have a, a different view on the american people elected joe biden to a four-year term not to a term of three years and ten months and we will use every day of our term to pursue the foreign policy interests that we believe are on behalf uh, that we believe are, are are in the interests of the american people if the dip, if the incoming administration wants to take a different view that is of course their right to do so uh, and I expect in many cases they will do so, but it is our duty to fulfill the mandate that the American people gave to President Biden, and we will continue to do that. And I would add that when you look at the, the, the position of the American public on support for Ukraine, there has been overwhelming support among the American people, and there's been overwhelming support in Congress for providing this aid to Ukraine. So we're gonna continue to provide it um, and get all of it out the door before we leave office.